What's up, tea cats? Dylan here from Woo Mountain Tea, coming at you with chapter five of the masterclass on tea, where we are talking about how to make the best cup of tea possible and avoid making the worst cup of tea possible with the tea leaves and the tea equipment you got in front of you. Whether you're making tea for yourself or your neighbor, Bill, or your ex-wife, Tammy, you got to know how to make the best cup of tea possible. And the thing is, so much of what makes a good cup of tea at the end of the day comes down to what you do as the preparer of tea. The tea producer, the tea master can do so much to make you a really high grade tea leaf but you need to know what to do next with those tea leaves i'm going to give you the one sentence summary of chapter five the tools we have to control tea leaf flavor extraction mainly include water temperature infusion time and leaf water ratio which we utilize carefully with less oxidized tea types lower quality teas or sit and soak infusion styles in order to avoid an overly astringent cup of tea and an unpalatable tcaa ratio so now let's boil down the sentence infuse and extract out the critical details and then just fling you out of this video with a crystal clear understanding of tea infusion and extraction for maximal flavor quality. The primary objective, and what I would hope to encourage you to have as your primary objective with preparing tea, is to make the most well balanced, well rounded, but still flavorful cup of tea that you can. We want rich flavor and good balance. We need good proportions. Good proportions of what might be the next question. So the main things that we're extracting out of the tea leaves into the water are those three compounds that I laid out and explained in chapter two actually when we were talking about biology of tea. So we got polyphenols, mainly catechins. That's the main subset of polyphenols we're looking at in tea. We got L-theanine, which is the main subset of free amino acids. And then we have caffeine. If you want a quick refresher on these molecules, their functions, how they're made in tea, what they taste like, etc., go back, check out chapter two. But we will be referencing these three classes of compounds a lot throughout this whole video. But the point is that we need these various flavorful compounds in good relative proportion to one another. Good relative proportion, but we also want a lot of them. Right? So good balance, well-rounded, but also high volume. We want that tea to be loud to help us accomplish this goal. We have three main tools of tea infusion at our disposal at all times. We got water temperature, we have infusion time, and we have a leaf to water ratio. So these are our three tools of infusion where it doesn't matter what tea you got in front of you, where it came from, where you bought it, what tea type it is, it doesn't matter. These three tools can still be applied to then optimize for flavor quality. Okay, so tool number one, we have water temperature. What are, how hot or cold is the water? This is our first critical, critical tool. Now here's the deal with water temperature. You're probably thinking, what's the deal with water temperature? Well, here's the deal. When you're letting tea leaves soak in water, at 100 degrees Celsius, and by the way, I'm gonna use Celsius throughout this whole video because I am most familiar in Celsius. All the science that I read and all the science I conduct is done in Celsius. It's a better system and it's easier. For Celsius and water temperature for tea, it's so simple because it's zero to 100. So I almost can just think about it in percentage wise. Like what, what percent boiled is it? Is it 90% boiled? That's 90 Celsius. 80% boiled, that's 80 Celsius. So I'm using Celsius, but I will add the Fahrenheit equivalents somewhere around here. Back to water temperature. If you are letting your tea leaves soak in 100 Celsius water, so boiling hot, that is favoring the extraction of tea catechins and caffeine. So those two classes of compounds are 
preferentially extracted at hotter temperatures. It's, 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 a, it's a direct line. The hotter the water, the more extraction of those two types of compounds that you get from the tea leaves. Pretty simple there. However, theanine, L-theanine, that primary free amino acid in tea, that extracts optimally at 80 Celsius. A refresher from chapter two will be that the polyphenols, the catechins, they are a little bit bitter, but mostly they're astringent. They provide the astringency to the brew. Caffeine, they're bitter. It's not like a super unpalatable bitter. Caffeine in the right quantity is good, actually. Caffeine is usually not the problem, not the thing we gotta worry about. It's the polyphenols, the catechins, because with too much of these, the tea gets way too astringent and it is basically undrinkable with too high a concentration of catechins. Now, we're gonna come back to catechins in a second. I'm just saying, for now, catechins are very astringent. Now, free amino acids that extract best to 80 Celsius, those are what create the sweet and savory umami sensations of tea. And we need those free amino acids to counterbalance the astringency brought by the catechins and create this well-balanced, well-rounded cup of tea. A good cup of tea, it has catechins. It has that tannic structure. It has a crisp kind of bite to it, right? It is a bitter leaf. You can't avoid the astringency and you don't want to. It wouldn't be the same tea with zero astringency. We need some catechins, but we can't let the catechins run the show. All right, we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta rein them in. And we do that with the free amino acids. They create that counterbalance to it. So with a good, well-rounded cup of tea, you got savory and sweet, and you have the crisp tannic structure. Now, these are infusing optimally, maximally at different temperatures, right? So now you can already start to see how water temperature is going to affect the proportions of these flavorful compounds, and it's going to affect the final flavor profile of your cup of tea. Put a pin in that concept for just a second. I wanna lay out the tools first, and then we're gonna come back and explain kind of more of the significance of the tools and how to apply them differently. Ah, yum. Tool number two is time, okay? Time of infusion. How long are you letting your leaves soak? I let this one soak for um, maybe 10 minutes, which is kind of absurd, but I'm filming a video and I forgot about it, so sorry. Time of infusion is critical. Here's why. Imagine this, imagine this. You have a cup, you toss your tea leaves in there, and you add hot water, call it 90 Celsius. Now, within the first three minutes of the tea leaves soaking and sitting in that hot water, almost all of the free amino acids will have been extracted out of the tea leaves and be in solution in the water, ready to go down the hatch and provide your mouth with a sweet and savory delicious sensation. So that's three minutes in. Caffeine is comparable to free amino acids a little bit later. Caffeine is more like on the order of four minutes, okay? But by minute four, the vast majority, maybe 90% of all the free amino acids and caffeine in the tea leaves are already extracted out into the soup. However, catechins are totally different. Those extract over a much longer time frame. So imagine our cup of tea with our leaves soaking in there. At minute four of soaking, the balance of flavorful compounds in the cup of tea is gonna look something like this. Right, You have a relative balance, a well-rounded proportion of amino acids, caffeine, and polyphenols. So that's minute four. Now we fast forward to minute 15, all right? So now it's 15 minutes at 90 Celsius. Like I said, the amino acids and the caffeine have already basically come all the way out in that first four minutes, but the catechins, they just keep pouring out of the tea leaves. They keep dumping into the tea soup. If we look at our little pie chart here, of flavor balance, 15 minutes later, the relative proportion of tea catechins has started to dominate the whole flavor profile of the tea. The balance of flavor compounds has been skewed towards way too many catechins, which, as we mentioned, is gonna create a cup of tea that's way too astringent, all right? That's not gonna taste good. We want balance. That's the deal with time, is that the different flavor compounds extract maximally at different times. So again, let's put a pin in that. We're gonna come back to it. I wanna get to my third tool of tea infusion, which is the leaf water ratio. This one's relatively simple. Basically, I view leaf water ratio as like a volume dial. A higher leaf water ratio, you're just turning up 
volume. You're making a louder cup of tea. And the proportions would be about the same, right? The proportions of these various flavor compounds, they stay consistent, but you're just getting more of everything. So if anything, it's the proportion of tea compounds in general to water that's going up as you increase your leaf water ratio. Now you got your three tools of infusion. Water temperature, infusion time, why am I counting my fingers this way? I don't know. And then we have leaf water ratio, three. Now, let's talk about how we apply these under different circumstances. And like I said in the beginning, there's a couple things you might encounter along the road of your journey in tea that are red flags. They're high risk situations for creating an overly astringent tea. And now I'm gonna introduce the technical concept for an overly astringent cup of tea. I've already alluded to it, a lot, but the idea is this tea catechin to amino acid ratio. This should already sound familiar at this point. The catechins are astringent in nature. They dry out the mouth tissue and create that like face shrinking, mouth puckering, like astringency of tea and free amino acids, sweet umami, they counteract the astringency. So the best, most technically accurate way to describe this well-balanced flavor profile is the TC to AA ratio. So now we're gonna be using that to describe this well-balanced tea flavor. So now let's talk about these circumstances where you have the potential to encounter and create an excessively high TC AA ratio. Number one, if you have a low grade Tea. If you haven't seen chapter four, the last chapter, I would recommend checking that out. But I took a really high grade first flush organic green tea and compared it using a systemized procedure of tea quality assessment to compare it to a super low grade, terrible tasting supermarket tea bag tea. Oh, ah, oh. Oh my God, that was way worse than I thought it would be. Oh, it tastes like bile acid. It was bad. I didn't like it. I hated every second of it. I don't want to think about it again, but the point is if you have that low grade type of tea, then you run a high risk of having too high a TCAA ratio. That's actually the reason why the taste was so bad and why I responded that negatively to the taste when I tried it. And so here's why low grade teas have this high TCAA ratio. The thing that differentiates high grade teas from low grade teas is actually not the catechin content, right? Both high grade and low grade teas can have a super rich abundance of these tea catechins. But the big differentiator between low grade and high grade tea is the free amino acid content. It's not the tea catechins, it's the free amino acid content. So now you can see how these two different teas are gonna have drastically different TCAA ratios, right? TC is constant, but AA in one is super low and AA in the other is super high. Now, say you encounter a low grade tea. I mean, step one, don't buy the low grade tea to begin with, but like I said in the beginning, I wanna teach you how to infuse any of the tea that you got in front of you. So say you got a low grade tea. Let's think about our three tools of tea infusion. Start with water temperature. We do not wanna bring that temperature above 80 Celsius. Anything above 80 Celsius is favoring catechin extraction over free amino acid extraction. You know, we wanna absolutely make the most of these low grade leaves, right? They don't have many amino acids in there, but every little one that we got, we wanna extract and pull out into the water. So 80 Celsius, you wouldn't wanna go anything above 80 Celsius. All right, what's another tool? We got infusion time. Like I showed with our little pie chart, right? The more you go past three minutes, the more the flavor profile is gonna skew towards a high TC, low AA ratio. 80 Celsius don't go above three minutes, right? And that might sound familiar because if you look at these tea bag teas in the supermarket on the packaging of these things, if you look at the steeping instructions, it'll say infuse at 80 degrees Celsius for three minutes. That's like the common prescription for these lower grade teas. Why? Well, now you know. These companies have done their research. They know that if the customers use a temperature above 80 Celsius or a time more than three minutes, their tea is gonna taste bad. But on the contrary, take a higher grade tea. With these higher grade teas, you're afforded the luxury of being able to use a bit higher water temperatures, a bit longer steep times, and extract more total flavor compounds out of the leaves 
into the soup. And that is gonna give you a cup of tea that is really rich and substantive with these flavor compounds, but still maintains that good TCAA ratio. You're getting a ton of flavor extraction, but you're not sacrificing that well-roundedness, that well-balanced cup of tea, which is the pinnacle, right? That's the, this is the holy grail of cups of tea. You want a lot of extraction, a lot of flavor, but you don't want to skew your flavor profile towards astringency in the process. That's the deal with low-grade versus high-grade teas. Again, best option, don't buy the low grade tea. So let's get to our next high risk situation as we're along our journey in tea here. And this one is actually relative to tea type, right? So we're not talking about tea quality anymore. We're talking about which of the six major tea types is the tea that you're infusing. So you will recall, I hope, from chapter three, I give you my catechin oxidation spiel. There is the general spiel of tea catechin oxidation. Catechins oxidized to theoflavins oxidized to the Arubigans, oxidized to the Abrownans, all right? The reason I had that spiel in chapter three was that this process is so important to tea processing in general. Whether you're stopping the process of catechin oxidation through fixing or you're encouraging catechin oxidation through withering, bruising, and fermentation, um, it's a huge underlying factor that affects the final flavor profiles of all the different tea types. But importantly for this conversation with catechin oxidation, you have catechins changing or transforming. They're either degrading or polymerizing or otherwise moving and transitioning into non-catechin compounds, molecules. So the more oxidized the catechins are, the, the greater the degree of catechin oxidation of the tea type, the less catechins you have remaining in the tea leaves. Now, how is that gonna affect our TCAA ratio? Well, a less oxidized tea has the potential to create a higher TCAA ratio than a tea with no catechins, which in such a tea, it would be pretty hard to create a high TCAA ratio because there's no TC. Let's give an example of the two extremes of the tea type spectrum. We have green tea on one end, where you'll remember from chapter three, we do that fixing right up front. And the whole goal of green tea processing is to preserve catechins and preserve these compounds that are abundant in the fresh tea leaf and preserve that crisp green freshness. On the complete opposite end, we have ripe puer tea, which is a super heavily post-fermented dark tea type. By the time ripe puer is done processing, it's gone through this two month post-fermentation process. All of the catechins in ripe puer have been already not only oxidized to theoflavins and theorubigans, such as the case of black tea, but they've even gone further into creating these theobrownins, which are like the most oxidized, the most transformed form of tea catechins. So if you're looking at ripe puer leaves, there's essentially zero catechins to speak of. So now we have the least oxidized and the most oxidized tea. So now let's apply our three tools of tea infusion differently according to these different teas. We'll start with the green tea. So let's take our green tea and we'll put some in a glass. If we're trying to prevent an excess TCAA ratio, we wanna be at 80 degrees Celsius and infuse for not too much longer than three to four minutes. So it's kind of the same concept as lower grade teas where we are being careful not to use boiling hot water for 10 minutes because there's tons of tea catechins in those less oxidized tea leaves and they will pour out into the tea infusion and it will create a tea which is not palatable. Can't be drinking that. Now on the flip side, we have ripe puer tea, which like I said, no catechins to speak of in these tea leaves. So when I'm infusing ripe puer tea, I am using boiling hot water, essentially. Sometimes I'll let those puppies soak for 10, 15 minutes. I mean, I do sick, sick things to my ripe puer tea leaves. I mean, it's borderline criminal what I do to these tea leaves, the way that I soak them for long periods of time in boiling hot water. It's just obscene. The point is when I do that, when I have these crazy thick soupy ripe puer extractions, I drink it and it's still smooth, still silky, sweet, smooth, goes down easy. I love every second of it. And in those cases, you're getting tons of flavor extraction. The amount of substances infused into the water there is super high, but that balance is still palatable, right? You don't have an excess amount of tea catechins in relation to tea amino acids because there's no catechins in there anyway. You have the extremes with green tea and, and ripe puer, but you also have the other bunch of tea types that are in the middle somewhere. And it depends. Oolong tea, for example, you have some oolongs that are very lightly oxidized, which are almost green teas, how lightly oxidized they are. 
And then you have some oolongs, which are almost black teas because of how heavily oxidized they are. Oolong is this huge hybrid category. So you gotta look at the oolong. How oxidized is it? And you can tell basically based on color, the greener oolongs are gonna be less oxidized, the darker, redder oolongs are gonna be more. But with these intermediary tea types, I generally say 90 Celsius, right? My general shtick here is 80 Celsius for green tea, 100 Celsius for ripe puer or heavily post-fermented dark tea, and then everything else, 90. That's generally what I do. And then obviously with the oolongs, less oxidized, push that thing closer to 80. And then with the more oxidized, you can keep it around 90. In the downloadable PDF document that I'm making for this chapter, and I do make one for every chapter, so keep an eye out for that, I will include a little figure and I'm sure I'll just show it to you right here. Right, you have green tea all the way on the less oxidized, you got ripe puer all the way on the end. And then I'm going to just generally put water temperature according to degree of catechin oxidation. So there's a little figure, print it out, maybe laminate it, put it above your tea table, tape it on the wall, maybe print a few of them, send them out to your friends, hammer them up on the, on the church door, right? Do what you're gonna do, but just keep this general guide of water temperature according to T-type in mind, and you'll be doing fine just fine. So last but not least, we have our last and final potential high risk situation that you might encounter along the path with tea. The example specifically that I'm thinking of is the tea tumblers. The idea with the tea tumbler is that you're throwing your tea leaves in this water bottle, essentially, and you're taking it with you to go. You're going on a road trip. Maybe you're going on a bike ride. Maybe you're going on a walk to the neighborhood, right? You want to go say, say hi to your friend Bill down the street. How's Bill doing? We don't even know. So you got your tea tumbler. You throw the leaves in there. And the thing with these is that you don't get to pour the tea out of the tumbler like you do with a gaiwan or a teapot. There are cases where you can use a tea tumbler as a teapot, where if the screen's in there, you'll let it soak and you'll pour it into other people's cups, right? That is a great way to use a tea tumbler actually, but most of the time you're just taking it on the go and you're not pouring it into something else before you drink it. You're just drinking it right out of the tumbler as if it's a water bottle. So in this case scenario, the infusion time is basically set constant. So your control over that tea tool of the infusion time is kind of taken off the table. You can't stop the leaves mixing with the water. They're just floating around and they're doing their thing. Now we have 20, 30 minutes of infusion, right? That's, that's a warning sign for excess TCAA ratio. You wanna be using lower water temperature and less leaves in such a circumstance. And I have made this mistake more times than I can count where I'm going on a road trip. I got a two hour drive ahead of me and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna be buzzing the whole way. I'm gonna fill up a big old thing of tea and I'm gonna put it in my little center console here and I'll be driving, bumping my tunes, drinking tea, it'll be great. But the thing that I forget is that my tea tumbler, it protects heat really well. It's kind of one of these heat keeping thermal tumblers. When I pour my tea in there to start, I use maybe five grams, which is kind of a lot, and I use like 90 Celsius water. Now fast forward 30 minutes into my drive, I go to take a sip and it's still like 88 degrees Celsius. It hasn't cooled off at all. And it's easy to drink hot tea out of like a cup like this. This is not a thermal heat keeping material here, this is porcelain. But in these tumblers, the temperature of the tea is so hot still. It's really hard, you're, you're moving, you're behind the wheel, right? You're trying to drink this scorching hot tea and you can taste already that the TCAA ratio is way out of whack because the water was way too hot and the leaves have just been soaking in this 90 Celsius water, right? And you can taste the flavors getting out of proportion so you wanna drink it faster so the infusion stops. So you're drinking this boiling hot, liquid and you're trying to do it fast and you're behind the wheel and you're scalding your mouth and the tea is spilling all over your shirt and you're swerving lanes, you're hitting pedestrians. <sighs> save the pedestrians, save your mouth, save your shirt for crying out loud. Now, the point of this absurd, ridiculous story is that if you're using these tea tumblers, when the tea leaves are soaking for that long of a time, use a much lower water temperature and even less leaves than you think that you need. If you use like 60 Celsius water, right? Like that's way too low for normal Gong Fu Cha tea infusion. If you're taking it on the go and it's steeping in there for 30 minutes, 60 Celsius will slowly extract the flavor out. It'll keep that TCAA ratio from getting way out of whack and it will actually be drinkable when you're driving and you won't be a risk to uh, pedestrians and other drivers. So safety first is the point. And then tea flavor quality second, a close second.
you know, I, honestly, that might be first. Safety could be second. I don't know. Maybe they're tied. Okay, safety and tea flavor quality are tied for first. Okay, but they're both important. Those were the three tools of tea infusion and three high risk situations that you might encounter along the path of tea. So now each time you come across one of these situations, you know what to do. You know how to use water temperature, how to use infusion time, and how to use leaf water ratio accordingly in each of those circumstances. So now you have the tools to even improvise with new situations. Say you're camping and you have a solar powered tea kettle that only gets to 50 Celsius or 60 Celsius. Okay, in that case, you're gonna use a lot of leaves and you're gonna use a long infusion time. You're gonna soak those puppies for 20, 30 minutes. You're gonna use a lot of leaf and you're gonna get a great cup of tea in the woods. Let's do another one. Let's say it's the last gram or two grams in your tea bag. You're almost out of tea. You gotta go and re-up with more tea pretty soon. In that case scenario, right, you have a low leaf water ratio. Then you're gonna soak those puppies in smoking hot water for as long as possible, right? That's gonna, you're gonna extract everything out of there because when the volume dial is that low, then you don't need to be so fearful of that ratio getting out of whack because at the end of the day, the flavor compound to water ratio is still so low that how astringent can it really get? Now we're being versatile. Improvise, adapt, overcome is all I can say. I want to conclude and close out chapter five with this final point. And the point is about personal preference. So the first thing is that any person's sensitivity to astringency, to bitterness, right, to the five taste elements is different from person to person. There's high inter-individual variability among our sensitivity and receptivity to these various five taste components. I mean, part of that's genetic. These uh, taste receptors are proteins and protein complexes. Anything that is protein-based comes back down to genetics, but it's also environmental, where if you're drinking tea all the time or you're eating otherwise bitter or astringent things regularly, you're gonna be acclimated and you might even start to like a certain degree of stringency and bitterness in your food and beverage. So that means if you're like a seasoned veteran tea drinker and someone comes to your tea table who's a bit of a newcomer to tea, they might not be as receptive to bitterness and astringency. So when you're preparing tea for them, maybe consider a little bit lower water temperature, a little bit lower infusion time. Contrarily, they might be sick or sicker puppies than you are, and they might love that astringency. So just be receptive to how they're responding to the tea, be inquisitive, say, how is that? And then kind of gauge their reactions and then change the next infusion based on how they responded, right? The point is that there is not a one size fits all approach to tea infusion. There's not, there's simply not, because people are different, cultures are different, teas are different, right? You have different qualities, different tea types, different this, different that. But if you have a good grasp of the three tools of tea infusion, then it doesn't matter what the path of tea throws your way, you're ready to rumble and prepare the best cup of tea and avoid a bad cup of tea with a way too high TCAA ratio. And now you know all of this information. Look at you. Get out there, start experimenting for yourself, see what you see, see what you find, see what you like, see what you don't like, and uh, let me know how it goes. Come back here, comment, let me know how it went. So that is it for chapter five. In chapter six, we are talking about tea consumption for human health. This is going to be an insane chapter. This is going to be lunacy. We're gonna be talking about neuroprotective effects of tea, right? The effects of tea on the brain. We're talking about the effects of tea on the microbiome, the effects of tea on weight loss or weight gain. It's gonna be a very nuanced conversation and we're gonna keep it science focused and science based. Until the next video, I want you to stay healthy. I want you to stay positive and most importantly, keep sipping tea. One love.